good to see those who are here out this morning. As has been mentioned, we do have several who are sick, we have several who are traveling, and we do need to continue to remember them in our prayers and, of course, uh, Braden's surgery and Jeff's surgery. Remember those, those in our prayers. The title of our lesson this morning is, Are You a Double-Minded Man? Which, of course, comes from James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, where James writes, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man. Uh, it's When I read this scripture, it makes me think of the argument that some people who claim to be Christians make to those who are not Christians. And when they say that, well, you should go ahead and, and serve God because you should hedge your bets. Because if God is not, then what have you lost? You've not really lost anything. You've lived a happy life. And if he's not, well, you'll be, you'll be gone anyway. But if, if God is, then if you've done what he said, then, then you would have the reward of heaven. And to me, that sounds like a double-minded man because Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, we're told that we must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You cannot hedge your bets and... and and, well, maybe God is, and maybe He's not, but I'm going to go ahead and do what He says just in case. Uh, that is a double-minded man. Vine's Expository Dictionary says this about double-minded man. It comes from the Greek dipsukos, which literally means two soul. Dis meaning twice, and suki, a soul. Hence, double-minded. Uh, it appears one other time in the Scriptures in James chapter 4 and verse 8 where James says, Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Uh, a double-minded man is one who won't commit. One who doesn't have the faith to commit to God. Uh, you think about it. How can you be a double-minded man. How can that possibly work? Uh, a double-minded man is basically a man who is at war with himself. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. It is impossible for us to serve God and man. You cannot have faith and doubt at the same time. These things are diametrically opposed. They are mutually exclusive. They're contradictory to one another, faith and doubt. Um, you, you can't serve God who is truth and righteousness and holiness and love and serve the devil who is a liar and unrighteous and unholy and hate. You can't serve both of these things at the same time because they're mutually exclusive. A man who is double-minded is at war with himself. Jesus said you can't do that. And why not? Matthew 12, 25. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself has brought the desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. The Jews accused Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Satan. They said, well, he does this by Beelzebub. He's casting out demons by Satan, the power of Satan. And Jesus said, that's ridiculous. He points out the, the fallacy in their logic, their, their thinking. Uh, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and it cannot stand. A kingdom divided cannot stand. A double-minded man cannot stand. We can't serve God and man. We can't successfully uh, navigate this life in service to God if we have doubt because faith and doubt are mutually exclusive. Faith and doubt are polar opposites. Faith produces action. Faith causes us to do things. 
Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, the record says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. If you read in Joshua chapter 24, which we did, I believe, last week in our one of our lessons, you find out that in Haran, they were idolaters. They were idolaters. God told Abram to get up and get out of there to a land that I'm going to show you. And Abram, by faith, did what God wanted him to do in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 10. The Hebrew writer tells us, By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abram, or Abraham, as God later changed his name, did what God told him to do. By faith, he did what God wanted him to do. And of course, as we study the Scriptures, we find out that God fulfilled the promises that He had made to Abraham. Abraham received the promises that God made to him. His faith caused him to do something. Doubt causes hesitation and failure. In Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse 22, the record says, Immediately Jesus made His disciples get into the boat and go before Him to the other side, while He sent the multitudes away. And when He had sent the multitudes away, He went up on the mountain by Himself to pray. Now when evening came, He was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw Him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Jesus comes to them walking on the water. They're afraid. And Peter says, Well, if it's you, you tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus says, All right, come on. So Peter hops off the boat, which takes a lot of faith. That's a leap of faith right there to hop off the boat where it's safe and get into the water where the wind and waves are, are being tossed about. And he starts walking on the water. Well, you'd think that that would cause his faith to be very strong. The fact that when he got off the boat, he was solid. He walked on the water. But when he looked around him and he saw what he was actually doing, he got scared. He didn't have faith. He had doubt. And he began to sink and he had to cry out to Jesus to save him. And Jesus did save him. And he called him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Doubt causes hesitation and failure. If we doubt the truth of God's Word, will we do what God's Word tells us to do? If we don't believe the things that are found in this book, are we going to take up our cross? Are we going to deny ourselves and follow Jesus? Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verses 46 through 49, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house in the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. If you doubt Jesus' word, you're going to do what he said. Because that's what the Christian life is all about. It is a life of service. 
It's a life of denying yourself. It's a life of placing someone else's needs and someone else's wants above your own. If you don't believe the things that are found in this book, are you going to do that? Well, absolutely not. You're not going to do that. And if you've got doubt at all, then your life is going to reflect that because you're not going to live the kind of life that would show Christ living in you because you're not going to be obedient to His Word. If you doubt the reward of heaven, will you press on to that goal? If you don't think that heaven is real, if you don't think that that reward is there and waiting for you at the end of this life, then are you going to work toward that goal? Well, absolutely not. Jesus said, though, in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Delay gratification. At the end of this life, there's a mansion that has been prepared for us. And we have the promise of that. But if you doubt that reward, are you going to put off the things that you want to do here in order to get the things that have been promised to us later? We live in a society where instant gratification is, is the way. We're encouraged to get what we want to get it now. And so the, the Scriptures are antithetical to that. We are encouraged in the Scriptures to lay up treasure in heaven where moths can't eat it, thieves can't steal it, rust can't destroy it. But those treasures in heaven, we have to wait. We have to wait. We're going to be willing to do that if we doubt the reward of heaven. <clears throat> if we doubt the power of God's Word when we teach it to others. <clears throat> if we re really don't believe that God's Word is the power of salvation, are we going to bother to teach it to others? Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 tells us that the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Romans 1.16 tells us that it is the power of God to salvation. If we doubt that, why are we going to bother to teach it to somebody else? And what good is it going to do us to bother to teach it to somebody else when they look at our lives and see that we really don't believe what's there? If you doubt God's Word, you're not going to teach it to someone else. That's just the simple fact of the matter. If you doubt the reality of death and judgment, how are you going to live for the day? We're admonished repeatedly throughout the Scriptures that, that we're frail beings, that our lifespan is short, and that even if we live to a ripe old age, our lives are but a vapor, and they're short, and that we're going to die and face judgment. If you don't believe that, how are you going to do the things that you need to do today if you think you're going to live forever like so many of us do when we're young? Or if you think that you're not going to have to answer for how you've lived your life. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, we're told, as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. It is appointed for all of us to die once. And after that we're going to be judged. Paul said in Romans chapter 14 and verse 10, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to be judged. If you doubt that, are you going to do the things that need to be done today? How are you going to order your life if you think you've got all of this time? If you think you have nothing to answer for? You're not going to live for that. If you doubt God's providence, will you cast your cares on Him like we're invited to do in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7? Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. If you don't think that God can control things through providence, are you really going to cast your care on Him? 
Well, of course not. And if you doubt that, then it really won't do you any good to be casting your cares anyway. Because James says we're not going to receive anything if we don't mind, if we have doubt. We've got to trust that God is in control. And He is. We're providence. Read the Old Testament and see the things that happen to people and the events that, that were in motion causing the end result that God wanted to happen. Look at Joseph's life like we've been doing on Wednesday nights and all the things that happened to him. And it all happened so that Joseph would end up the second command behind Pharaoh so that many people's lives would be saved. And so that Israel would find favor in Egypt for a time and allow them to flourish, God's people. God is in control through providence and we are invited to cast our cares on Him because we trust that. We trust that God can help us through whatever our situation might be, whatever cares we might have. We believe that God can help us through and that He will help us through. If you doubt God's providence, are you going to do that? You might as well talk to the wall if you doubt some things that cause doubt, <clears throat> false doctrine. False doctrine absolutely causes doubt. Acts chapter 13, verses 6 through 12. Now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God, but Elimus, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who also was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O fool of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Paul and Barnabas were going to teach Sergius Paulus, the proconsul. Elimus, the sorcerer, was stood them. <clears throat> False teaching. Trying to destroy the faith that Sergius Paulus ended up having anyway because of the things that took place. Paul was there to strike Elimus blind. To cause him to not be able to see. Sergius Paulus saw that. He believed the things that they taught but today we don't have that ability any longer. We have the scriptures revealed and preserved and before us at this time. And we can't strike people blind when they contradict what the scriptures teach. And false doctrine absolutely destroys the faith of people. And that's what we're told in 2 Timothy 2, 15 through 18. We often quote 2 Timothy 2, 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But verse 16 says, But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of the soil, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection has already passed, and they overthrow the faith of some. Their false doctrine overthrew the faith of some. They said the resurrection's already passed and some people doubted because of that. Their faith was overthrown. False doctrine, Paul calls it or likens it to cancer. Have you ever seen a cancer that's good? And this is a malignant cancer because he says it's spreading and overthrowing people's faith. That's what false doctrine does. And we can't strike people blind. We can help them see, though. When we do what Paul said, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, and the old King James says study. We can help people. But all this division that exists in the religious world, all of the different doctrines that are taught, they destroy people's faith. They don't know where to turn. Because everywhere they turn, they're told something different. 
but we do know where to turn. And that's not to me, and that's not to Bobby or Daddy or Toby or anybody else. Turn to the Scriptures, because that's where the truth is at. Human logic and biblical ignorance cause doubt. Paul said in Colossians 2 and verse 8, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. People who, uh, and I always think of, of the creationist evolutionists, the theistic evolution, where they try to reconcile theory of evolution with the account of creation in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. That's human logic trying to justify what God has revealed to us based on our limited understanding of science. Which science is nothing more than coming to understand the way that God has created things and made them to work. And we don't have perfect understanding and yet we have the revelation from God of everything that we need to know, all things that pertain to life and godliness. According to 2 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to take that and try to make it fit in with some idea that we've got. Human logic and biblical ignorance. Destroying people's faith. How many people doubt the creation account in Genesis because of that? And then you begin to doubt Genesis chapters 1 and 2, and then you get into chapter 3 and the account of the fall of man and how sin came to be in the world. And you make the snake, not literal, the serpent. And then what does that do to all of the prophecy that is there in chapter 3? Where do you, where do you draw the line? People's faith gets destroyed. Because you can't draw the line because it's a slippery slope. You hear people talk about a slippery slope and you just slide right down. And pretty soon your, your faith in the Word of God is completely nullified because of human logic and biblical ignorance. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, Paul said, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He catches the wise in their own craft." smart as we might be, as smart as we might think we are, it's all foolishness to God. And like the proverb says, fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And this is the knowledge that we need to get us through in this life. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, Peter writes, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, and which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the Scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. Biblical ignorance. Taking the Scriptures, the things that Paul wrote, is what Peter's talking about in this context. Twisting them and perverting them to your own destruction, and then some people are led away with the error of the wicked. They're caused to doubt because of biblical ignorance. And that's what we see all around us today. Our failures can cause us to doubt. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, John writes, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is, and everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. We're encouraged to purify ourselves. First John, over and over, as we're seeing in our study on Sunday mornings, talks about leading the life of light, walking in the light, eliminating sin, not practicing sin, not having that as a lifestyle. And he talks about how we're supposed to purify ourselves because we have hope that we'll be like Jesus one of these days when he appears, when he's been revealed. We're striving to be like Christ. And there's not a one of us that is sinless. 
but we know that that is supposed to be our goal, but we don't always live up to that. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How many of us in our lives have ever had a point to where we have given in to some evil desire or some lust of the flesh or whatever it might be and we sin and and the guilt is, is overwhelming and the disappointment that you feel in yourself and you know if my brothers and sisters knew how weak and pitiful I am they'd, they'd never accept me and how is God going to forgive me? I can't, I am vile. I think probably all of us at some point in our lives have done that and been there. But we have to remember that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22, the Hebrew writer tells us, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He consecrated for us through the veil that is His flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Knowing that the blood of Jesus is sufficient, that the blood of Jesus pays the price for our sins, we can have faith in that. We can come to the throne of grace with the full assurance of faith. Sometimes when we sin, that causes us to doubt that. We should never doubt that. Because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. We don't have to have any doubt. Any doubt at all. Paul in first. Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15 said that he was the chief of sinners. He said Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of sinners of whom I am chief. But in 2 Corinthians or 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8, he said, Finally, there is laid up for me that crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge will give me in that day. He considered himself the chief of sinners, but he knew that crown of righteousness waited for him. When he came to the end of his life, and why? You back up to verse 7, 2 Timothy chapter 4. He had fought the good fight. He had finished the race. He had kept the faith. And he knew that because of Jesus coming into the world to save sinners, shedding his blood, that he had hope. Even though he considered himself the chief of sinners. Well, how do we remove that doubt? Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The more that we read and the more that we study, the less doubt we'll have. Because the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two eggs so even the chapter 4 and verse 12. When we study God's Word, we will increase in faith. It's inevitable. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Acts chapter 20 and verse 32, we're told by Paul, as he spoke to the Ephesian elders there, speaks to us as well. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. God's Word is able to build us up and give us that inheritance. We have to trust that. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. In 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, we're told, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Salvation through faith. We are made wise for that by the Scriptures. The Scriptures make us wise for salvation by faith. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 5, John said, But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Again, the lesson that we've learned over and over again from 1 John. The truth, we have the truth. That truth is the light in which we're to walk. And when we keep that truth, the love of God is perfected in us. And we know that we are in Him. Because we have the truth and because we live the truth. 
And that's how faith, faith comes about. That's how doubt is pushed out. How do we remove doubt? We draw near to God through faith. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 22 and 23. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, drawing near to God. James had said, as we saw earlier, that we draw near to God, the devil will flee from us. We draw near to God through faith, and when we do that, it removes doubt. And we realize that nothing can move us away from God. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, Paul said, For I am persuaded that neither life, death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we draw near to God, if we draw near to Him, nothing can move us away from Him. Absolutely nothing. And there is great assurance in that. And then we need to be fully persuaded of God. Remove all doubt by being fully persuaded of God. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, Paul writes, For this reason I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. He's talking about the fact that he's in prison, not because of any wrongs that he's done, but because he was preaching the gospel. And he said, I suffer these things, because I do that. But it makes no difference. Because he is persuaded that God is able to keep what I've committed to him to that day. We can all be persuaded of that. When we understand the power of God. And the wisdom of God. And the righteousness of God. We can know that when we make the effort that it doesn't matter what man does to us. None of those things make any difference. Because God, God knows us. And He is a righteous judge. And He is merciful. And when we're fully persuaded, that will remove doubt. The conclusion of the matter, doubt sees obstacles sees the obstacles and causes questions. Matthew chapter 19, verses 23 through 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? The doubt sees the obstacle. You've got the picture painted of a camel going through the eye of a needle, well, that's impossible. Who can be saved? That comes from doubt. But faith sees the way and trusts God as the solution. Verse 26, Matthew 19, But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. We can have faith, brethren. Let us not be double-minded men. Let's have faith. Be saved today if you're not. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, John 3, 16. If you believe, God so loved the world that He gave His only God's Son, that you sort of believe in Him should not perish, but have a life in life. You've got to believe. You've got to repent. Luke chapter 13, verse 3. May I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You've got to confess that Jesus is the Christ. Romans chapter 10 and verse 10 tells us that confession leads to salvation. You've got to be willing to do that. And you've got to be baptized. Acts 22, 16. And Ananias told Saul, And now why are you waiting? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You've got to be willing to do that. And then you've got to live faithfully. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. If you're here this morning, you haven't obeyed the gospel, do you? If you're here this morning and you're a Christian and you've not been faithful as you need to be, you need to repent. I pray with you for you and God will forgive you. Whatever your need might be, please come forward and make it known while together we stand.